Welcome back to Philosophy of the Barber. Today's guest is John Stewart, also known as Johnny Limit. He is the owner of Stanley's Barbershop in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, he's owned that barbershop for the last year. Congratulations. Happy anniversary. Thank you. And he has been a licensed barber here in New Hampshire since 2016. How's it going? It's going awesome. How are you today? Oh, I can't complain. Um, so, first things first, because we haven't had much of a conversation before. Um, so, I'm in the same boat as the audience, where it's like, ooh, we're learning new things about new people. This is fun. So, <laughs> you are someone who apprenticed. Yes. Instead of going to a barber school. So, that's a first for the, the show, the very young show so far. Um, so tell me how you mentally like decided that you wanted to be a barber in the first place. Well, I, um, I was doing tire service before and it's a pretty laborious job and uh, I have a lot of friends in the industry. It looked pretty fun. You could be creative and be your own boss. And, um, I was approached by like a really good friend of mine, Josh Hines, the owner of Best Times Barbershop and Stromwell Barbershop. And he offered to apprentice me. This is in uh, about the summer of 2015, so I started like thinking of the idea of doing it and like coming in, checking it out, sweeping, uh, you know, just watching haircuts, meeting like the staff there, you know, and I decided it was something I wanted to do, so uh, I just uh, took the plunge in like that November and got like, an official apprentice license and did the program. So um, when he offered to apprentice you as opposed to referring you to a barber school, had he had an apprentice before? No, it was the first one at the shop. And he had he'd obviously been a barber for a few years. Best of times had been there for, for a little while at that point, right? Yeah. So uh, how was the apprentice process? Because uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, doing an apprenticeship in the state of New Hampshire is uh, twice the number of hours as going to barber school. Uh, so there's a lot of on-the-job training and a lot of uh, self-driven book work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like it's a really good experience because you get a lot of hands-on training with professionals. Everyone I worked with at the time had been doing it for years, and I was like, oh, man, they're, like, light years ahead of me. I need to get, like, that, like, instantly. So it was, like, uh, it was cool to see, but it was always kind of, like, stressful being like, oh, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was good. They, uh, they taught me things. And then, like you said, I did a lot of, like, the bookwork stuff. Like, kind of got the textbook the Milady firing book. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you just had to do for the apprenticeship program in New Hampshire, I think just like one test a month. But I actually did the full book, did like all the chapters and like was very self-motivated. Just wanted to get the program to learn as, as small, as fast as possible and like be cutting hair proficiently. Sure. So you're, you're very self-driven. I feel like that's a requirement for anybody who's who's looking to get into an apprenticeship. Like you can't, have that need to have somebody on you to do things you yeah. have to like you be self-driven to, totally you can't just have yeah because it's like no one has like they're not like real teachers like they, they can teach you things but they're working full-time and you're just kind of in the mix you know and um well, plus the, they're a walk-in shop right yeah it's a walk-in so shop so it's kind of whatever you learn that day is whatever walks through the door yeah exactly and it, but it was cool though. Like I made a real big mental note of like the clients, the things we talked about, haircuts they got. I would know what people got for haircuts before I ever cut their hair. So they'd sit down. I'm like, oh yeah, I usually get like this. This is what we're doing today. And they'd be like, yes. <laughs> so um, did that help or hinder you uh, when it came to having new customers and figuring out what they wanted for a haircut? Um, I think it maybe a little bit of both. Because it's like, oh, this works for you. But I don't really like to tell people what they should get for a haircut. I mean, I've learned from experience some ideas that, like, some things don't work. I learned that around that time because, no, someone will tell you, oh, I want, like, an undercut. But I want it to be an inch long. And you're like, okay. You're just on autopilot. You're like, I'm going to do what the customer says. And then you do it, and it's, like, not flipping over and just looks crazy. You can never do what the customer says. But then you're responsible for it. But you learn from that, and you go, okay, next time someone says this, I'm not going to necessarily talk them out of it, but I'm going to explain what happened before and be like, maybe that's not the right route to go. And they'll appreciate you doing that, you know? Oh, yeah. Educating your customers is one of the responsibilities of being a good barber. 
whether it's on a subject of a hair product or it's on a, you know, I know you spouted off numbers to me, but you don't know what those mean. It's oh. kind of like telling your doctor you need a certain medication when you don't actually know what that treats. Totally. Um, I just wanted to make a note back to the apprenticeship thing. When I was doing it, it was like a full year. You had to do 16, at least 1600 hours and it has to, you have to wait a whole year before you can take the state boards. Right. And uh, I don't know if it's the same, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> well, the things are changing constantly, yeah, especially yeah, in our profession. I, and that was like a few years ago, so I don't even know now. Well, even the, the state board test changes all the time. Yeah. It seems like they you keep dumbing it earlier. down, making it easier and easier. It's like, I, if the government could just, just say what they need to say by going, we just need to make sure that you can do it safely. Yeah. That you're not going to maim anyone. And if you happen to cut them, that you know how to clean it up properly. That's all they can measure. Yeah. Everything else can't be quantified whether or not you you cut hair well or whether or not you shave well. It's the, can you do it safely? Can you do it safely? And that's yeah. what the license is. Can you do your job safely? And then you just, uh, you just get to hone the skills from there, you know? Yep. And everything else is, you know, the art and the craft. The, the trade is, you know, doing it properly. Absolutely. All right. So how is it? the past year owning the shop uh at stanley's it's been really fun it's a uh, it's been a lot of new tasks i i enjoy i am the type of personality that likes to constantly be doing something and i found from being like a business owner you're constantly like you paying these bills or you know going over analytics or marketing or just like rehabbing stuff you know what i mean so since i came aboard the stanley's team i Repainted the walls. I had the floor redone. I did some new rebranding. Had a new logo made. Got some merch, some new pomades. You know, it's, I don't know. Just did some stuff I thought would make it cool and fun and look sharper. Having creative control is definitely one of the perks of owning. Yeah. Oh, totally. So, now you have a very unique position where you work at a shop that you don't own. Hmm. And yet also own a shop. So... How how does uh, your shop owner feel about that? Like, does that cause any concerns? But I know that they're very separated. Like, there's yeah. a lot of distance between them. There's like an hour between them, so most people wouldn't travel that far for a haircut. I mean, I would. Most barbers would, but um, there's like no concern there. It's just like how my situation organically came about. In like in the few words, is like uh, I did an apprenticeship at Best Times Barbershop. I worked there for a few years, and then Josh, the owner of Best of Times, opened Stronghold Barbershop, and then the team we all had there, we were kind of growing in that, that spot where Stronghold is, is 280 Central Ave. It's uh, iconic in Dover, New Hampshire for like being a barbershop since like the mid-60s. It was Louie's, and it was a bunch of other barbershops, so it's like a really cool spot to, to be able to get into. Any, anyways, he opened that shop. It was awesome. It was like a barber shop slash arcade. And we all kind of went back and forth. So instead of like oh, we're all being at best times, now we all kind of split up our time doing like three shifts here, two here, vice versa. And then the last couple of years with like, you know, new barbers coming on and stuff, I kind of just worked there full time. And I've been there for the last couple of years. And every once in a while, I'll still pop in at best times and work. But it's kind of like we're a big shop broken into two. It's like they're kind of the same shop. And then um, so I've been over there like nonstop since I started cutting hair. And then the opportunity to buy Stanley's came about a year or so ago. And I was like, man, this is an awesome little barbershop. My friend owns it. My friend Matt we were talking about offered to sell me the shop. And there's really no room. It's already like a full shop. Like he's been there for, I think, eight years now. Erica has been there for, sorry, Canadian, I don't know this. I want to say like four or five years, I believe. And Bucky about two years, so and it's a three chair shop, so there's only a, well, there was only a few shifts for me to actually work there, and um, I kind of just took over the back end stuff, and I kind of fit myself where I fit in, you know. So I was doing like four days here in Dover, two days in Manchester, up until the pandemic, and then um, it's a small shop, so our center chair we can't use right now because of the six feet social distancing. So we staggered the schedule a little bit, and I'm actually only in Manchester on Sundays right now, temporarily, and uh, yeah, full-time in Dover still. Nice, and I think that's a phenomenal um, option that I, I don't think a lot of people really get. Like, when you have the opportunity to purchase 
uh, a shop that's historically been around for a very long time and they have a full staff it's like and who wants to sell it to you still wants to work there yeah it's like sweet like i can just own it and like do the back end stuff and it can basically run itself otherwise totally or it's like i don't have to fill an opening and that's kind of what i wanted to mention too is like the shop is awesome the shop was awesome before me but i feel like i always describe stanley's as like a diamond in the rut like uh an awesome little place that not a lot of people knew about, and I'm just trying to show more people about it and make it kind of shine. Like, hey, we're here, yeah. <laughs> you know? And being able to support something that you know is already great yeah. and going, all right, I see where some of the things could be better that you can control, and it's like, hey, cut hair because you've been doing great. I just want to make sure that no- more people know about it and we have good branding and all of the business stuff. Totally. That some people don't necessarily have the strength uh it's a whole other job, area. really. Yeah. It's like you're barbering, and then it's now you're the business owner. You're in charge of marketing and cleaning and fixing the windows, and this thing broke, you know, and I'm making it you're sound a bad. But you're landlord. But yeah, <laughs> there's a lot going on. A lot of things, you, you constantly look at the spa, too, and you're like, you know what? It'd look cool if I had some benches here, or like we had the windows done up, or whatever, you know? Well, I think that's uh, one of the perks of not having to fill a spot in the shop is that you have the ability to be away from the chair and see the from the perspective of a customer and see how they're looking at it to see like the little weak points like oh that looks like it could you know use a coat of paint or hey we need to make sure that we you know get in this corner because it tends to collect a lot of hair and dust yeah um you know being able to focus on those details that customers notice but if you're behind the chair all the time you don't always get a chance to sit in a waiting chair absolutely and I like, I don't know, I'm into like product and merchandising. Like I used to be in bands and stuff. I'll constantly make like, you know, apparel, shirts, hats, whatever. So I like to like add that flair to, to Stanley. I'm like, all right, let's do a shirt. Let's do this. And it incorporates sometimes like my, my personality into it. Like I just made, uh, this is a 90s skateboard brand called Shorties. And it is cool like shirt that went across the sleeves. And I don't know, it's kind of like, just like a homage to that kind of thing, you know, and this little stuff that I'm into and kind of put your own twist on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And offering a, another artistic outlet outside of, you know, a haircut. Totally. Yeah. I think that's one thing that people that are getting into barbering don't necessarily think about, especially if one of their long-term goals is to own a shop is that there's another half of the business that you have to figure out. You know, there's of course the bookkeeping and the, the taxes and like that end of things that is, personally my weak point I, I i strongly dislike and struggle with that area though i found a way through it uh but it's the 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 concern for the atmosphere and the experience that a customer's having not just you know the product that they're leaving with but the actual experience of being in the chair and who they're talking to and the surrounding um decor and energy that they experience that's within the control of whoever owns the shop if yeah. they're willing to to put forth that effort i always say there's like three sides to barbering and i try to tell people there's obviously cutting hair safely and well having like uh, good customer engagements talking to people and trying to be friendly and build like yeah, making a good experience you know but what you just touched on is huge too, is like self-discipline with taxing. Because as a barber, you are literally your own small business in a business and you have to have that discipline of like, I need to save this, this is for taxes. Because if you just wing it in the end of the year, you really can hurt yourself, you know, so. Oh yeah, or if you're like doing the, the math of how many haircuts you have to cut that week in order to, you know, do whatever you're wanting to do. It's yeah. like, yeah, that's that's not good accounting. I think it's like a little bit, a little bit every day is the best way to do it. Because uh, you do it at the end of the week or the end of the month, and it looks like, wow, that's like a lot. But it's definitely doable, like, Wait. Well, obviously. <laughs> well, and especially if you look at, you know, that's how the government does it, where it's like, take it out of every paycheck. Yeah. Well, if you get paid every day, then take it out of every paycheck. Exactly. It may be cash, but <laughs> you can still do just it the same it. way. That Other way it side. hurts less. <laughs> Absolutely. Little by little, not just like all at the end of the month or end of the quarter. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, Totally. So, um, how have you enjoyed the whole, uh, interaction with customers? Cause I get the impression that you're naturally, uh, more of an introvert than you are an extrovert. I Correct me if I'm wrong. 
I don't know. I'd like to think I'm more probably more extrovert. I I like to talk to people. Um, I kind of you need to probably do the same. Like gauge people. You like talk to them and see how they're responding. If you're getting a lot of like one word answers, it's probably like, all right. Let's let them chill and focus on what I'm doing. You know. But um, I try to find like common grounds. Like oh, uh, you know, what what's going on in Netflix? You know, and just try to talk to anyone about anything. What they got going on. What they're about. What they do. So everybody has like their core favorite customers. Like nobody talks about it, but we do. Um, it's kind of like being an aunt or an uncle. Like you got your favorite nieces and nephews. You don't tell them that, but you do. Um, so like what kind of stuff do you really connect with people with that really makes it like exciting? It's like, oh, sweet. This person's coming in today. Awesome. I know we're going to have a fantastic conversation. Uh, let me think. Kind of got me off guard there. Um, any like meaningful conversation, really? That's not just like the rundown of like, the same like thing, you know? It's not like superfluous small talk the whole yeah. time. Yeah, if you can have like a conversation, you kind of walk away from it, like, wow, that was cool. Like yesterday, I talked to someone, and I'm like gonna probably butcher his wording, but describing like doing a job you like and how it's worth more to you if you get paid less if you're doing something you like. In I don't know, just the balance of that, you know? Yeah. Just like stuff like that or just inter anything interesting, really. You know what I mean? That kind of like isn't the same thing every day. Because we have a really unique opportunity where we can, and I've always appreciated this, talk to different people that you never, that I probably never would have encountered before. And because I work in like barbering, I meet all sorts of people, all sorts of walks of life, you know? Oh, yeah. We have the, the spectrum. And we get to learn so much from them because of that. Yeah. And that's, I think not um, emphasized enough as one of the perks of the profession is yeah. that if you want to learn something, all you got to do is stop and listen. Oh, totally. If you, if you learn how to listen, you can learn a lot. And if you're local, you find out um, anything you need. Oh, who's the mechanic? You know, where can I get this done? Well, and there's that expectation as a barber in the community that if somebody comes to you with a question on something that they need, that you'll have the answer because you get everybody in your chair. Yeah. It's funny, too, because I live in Manchester, which I have roughly the last like 15 years, and I talk to so many people in the Seacoast where I usually work, and I hear about these places I never see, and once in a while I'll drive through town, and I get like surprised when I see places that I've heard so much about or talked so much about. I'm like, oh, there's that restaurant. That's the thing. That's that's what they're talking about. I don't know. It becomes more like words to me because I, I you know, dip out because I drive like an hour, two hours every day, hour home. So don't usually spend a lot of time perusing around Dover. Well, I think that if you took uh, once a month or whatever to, to go and explore and, and pop into those places that your clientele would just be ecstatic in seeing you, especially because they know that you live out of town, I'm sure. Yeah. So they'll be like, oh, Johnny, what's up? Yeah, it's funny. They haven't in Manchester there. there. I thought that was even more unique because, like I was saying, the last year I've only cut hair in Manchester like two days a week, one day a week most of the time, and now one. And I got yelled at by a guy. N not yelled at, but he's like, oh, you got my son's hair. Remember last week? And I was like, oh, yeah. Have a nice night. <laughs> but it was cool, though. It's nice to be, like, recognized, you know, for the shop. That's, that's branding. It's cool to see people. It's a human connection, you know. I have one of my barbers, uh, she's – She's young, but she's also learning that, oh, the whole concept of living in a community that you work in, that going to the grocery store is like wear a hoodie and sunglasses because yeah. everybody's going to stop you and say hi. <laughs> That's funny. That actually happened to me when I was leaving. I ran into a customer when I was walking out uh, because Stronghold is connected to Tokens and uh, Tokens Taproom. And it was like, our, we would do like the family hours on um, Saturdays and uh I don't know, just talked for like five minutes because I haven't seen him in a while since everything's been going on. He, he's usually like a once a weeker, you know, one on top, high skin fade. And I didn't even know who I was talking to for a minute, but he knew my name. He's like, oh, hey, Johnny. And I'm like, yeah. You ever like talk to someone, you like pretend like you know who they are? All the and time. then I started talking to him, and I'm like, I, he was playing a, a pinball game, so he didn't notice it, but I, then I, I realized, I'm like, I do know you. And I was like, oh, hey, how's it going, man? How's this? How's that? I've been in New York again recently. But I don't know, it's kind of funny. It's good when you can talk to someone and you like don't remember but you're trying to remember and then you actually remember and you're like oh oh i, have I do remember i have that problem all the time and it's it's not necessarily that i don't remember them it's that i have to 
figure out where I know them from because I'm fairly active in the Laconia community when it comes to like city stuff. That's awesome. Um, as well as the shop and then uh, active in my church as well. So it's like, all right, where do I know you from? Oh, mm. yeah, totally. It's a guessing game. I First assumption is the shop. But if uh, the haircut does not look familiar, then I will be like, mm, maybe not. Maybe somewhere else. Did you ever get that feeling that's like the same thing, but the opposite? You're like, I feel like I don't like this person, but I don't know why. I, this is not to do with barbering, but I remember I was at the pet store once, and this guy started talking to me. I'm like, I don't know what this dude is, but I feel this weird like spider sense. And then I remember he's like one of my neighbors that like got really mad at me once because I like threw trash in his trash can like while I was walking on the street. But it's funny. Yeah, uh, I and mean, I get a I get a read on people pretty pretty quick anyway, and yeah. that's one of the virtues. It's great to be a barber and have that talent. Yeah. But it's it's very like even in the most benign situation, if I get a strong vibe from you. I trust the vibe because there's a reason. I don't know what it is consciously, but there's a reason. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not going to be like you're, you know, blocked forever and ever. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> I'm going to be a little, like, cautious. That's cool. You're active in the community. I'm trying to do more stuff like that in Stanley. It was like um, last year we did like a school drive and we had like collected trapper keepers and notebooks and pens. And then we did like a, a Christmas toy drive thing. I can't remember which one it was for. But anyways, it was fun because you could like support local businesses. I got like a skateboard from a shop I like and threw it in there, you know, some kids going to get hooked up. Oh, it's, it's great to be part of the community, especially if you're in a downtown area like we are. Um, the merchants and like everybody kind of goes to each other's place. Oh, totally. And really like props each other up and supports each other. Uh, and if you're not part of that, it's very obvious and typically somebody who doesn't like fit into that network doesn't last because with our winters being so long up here, especially uh, if you don't get through the winter with the locals, that's half the year, man. Like if you can't get through the winter, forget it. Unless you are specifically like only open for the season. Yeah. Then it's like, all right, if you shut down through the winter, like that's your choice. If, if you're, books make sense cool you can do that but in order to operate year-round you have to have the locals because we're such a vacation destination that in the summertime it doesn't matter how good or bad you are at your job yeah. chances are you're going to get business people are here because cool. we've only got so many things that are open no but yeah if, if you don't have the locals on your side forget it yeah it's integral to be part of the community for sure well it's great for just like i ha i have we do a the Greater Lakes Region Children's Auction happens like the first week of December every year, and it's a whole to do like TV broadcast, radio, internet, live stream, like bidding all week with stuff that people donate. And it's great for us because we can take one day of our year and just move the shop to that location for the day. And just by doing that, number one, it breaks up the day for us. Like, it's like, oh, something new and different. We're in a different situation. Yeah. We have to, like, problem solve because it's not an ideal barbershop situation. But it's also like, oh, we get to see so many people that we only see at the auction. Yeah, it's it's good for the community, but it's also great for your brand, too. I mean, I've seen that do wonders for, like, um, Best Defense Barbershop. They have Apple Harvest Day in Dover, and they always set up outside. It's not, like, really far away, but that was, like, monumental, I feel like, with that first shop because that – Got a lot of people's attention, seeing the people cut hair outside. And like you said, it's kind of out of your element, like having the booth outside is, and like a lot of people walking around. I can't really take credit for it. I didn't personally cut hair outside, but I've been a part of a lot of those cutting hair inside or passing out pamphlets or combs or both, you know? Well, just like putting yourself out there, um, especially if somebody, like you're in a an area where your shop is very visible. So they have that initial like, oh, I've driven past there. Like I, I see that all the time. But you have that the secondary uh, confirmation with interaction mm -hmm. that's direct, that's memorable to, to compound on that almost subconscious, like don't noticing of your signage or your location Oh, totally. that really kind of seals the deal with like, they're more open to, to go to that establishment mm -hmm. and that's business. And as somebody who's never done anything outside of owning a shop when it has to do with business, like no business courses, no nothing. I, I just winged it. 
It's like some things just naturally make sense. Yeah. And other things you have to learn. I think that's kind of what it is, though, too. It's like you, they always say, like, you, you know, it takes a year to, like, survive. And I think that's because, like, you need to go through a whole calendar year of your, of your billing, your problems, your situation. And then once you figure all that out, you go, okay, cool. This is what happened. And if you had any issues, you go, how can I address this or make this better? You know? And then every year you should hopefully get better. And figuring out patterns and noticing, like, what events or, um, you know, things on the calendar, how it affects your, your flow of business oh, yeah. and, you know, community events. It's the, oh, there's a fair in town, so that's where everybody is and we're dead. Or, um, you know, like, for us, it's motorcycle week. Like, we as a downtown business are not busy during motorcycle week because mm-hmm. all of that action happens in the weirs and it just doesn't trickle down here. Um, so it'll be, like, slightly slower than normal or normal week. Where it's like the locals are like, all right, the bikers aren't going to get a haircut or a beard trim or a shave. Yeah. So we can slip down there and do that. Um, so it's really just like learning what unique things or like traffic picks up during um, prom season or graduation. Oh, yeah. Back or, to school. Or... Yeah. Back to school. Like any of those things that like you aren't necessarily on a calendar, but you kind of got to learn when they're coming up. Yeah. Like whether you have kids or not. The school year you matters. Learn. Oh, you totally learn. Yeah, it's always like a big deal in August, like back to school. And then there's, we call it like the Trinity of the year. You got like your, your Thanksgiving, your Christmas, holidays, New Year's. And then we can't chill until like January. Oh, yeah. February, like January is like when the gift cards come in from Christmas for us. Yeah. And then February, March is like, all right, we're going to be like slow. Yeah. So, so anytime somebody comes in when we're not having a pandemic, and they're like, so when are you guys not busy? I'm like, February. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I, I wish like I could tell you a day of the week, but I can't. I always <laughs> think like Valentine's Day. We're going to be busy then. And like oh, yeah. sometimes there's like that week, you know, people. But after that, it drops. Yeah. And then spring begins and people are like. Easter. Get, yeah, skin fade. It goes from like one to tighter, you know, so. Well, there's that 50-50 shot that Easter will be under snow. Yeah. So it's really like, I don't want get Grandma to give me grief the way she did on Thanksgiving. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of snow, it, it snowed eight months. Yeah. Like, what is it, October, April? Oh, uh, it snowed in May this year. Yeah. There you go. It, it snowed the same month that we hit 92 degrees. It was Welcome like a week apart. I couldn't believe it. I was like, disaster yet? But I don't know. I'm not a big fan of snow. I kind of just, I've always been in New Hampshire or in, in Mass when I was younger, but what, New England, I've just like endured the winter. I've never done anything like snowboarding or skiing. Yeah, I'm not an outdoorsy person either. I just uh, suffer. But here you have to be a hardy individual. And I'm not a New Hampshire local by any means. I'm from Ohio, so I'm not used to the mountains. No. I've lived here for 10 years now, so I'm, I'm fairly good at the whole lay of the land situation. But you're not going to catch me on the ski slopes. You're not going to catch me snowshoeing. Like, you're lucky I own a kayak. Yeah. Yeah, my family was never into that. It just seemed like uh, every, all that stuff's, like, really expensive. It was, like, you got your sled. You got your, like, snowboard from you know, a small store. You know, we went around the hills, you know. But I don't know. So More of a spring, summer, fall person. Fall, for sure. Since we touched on the pandemic, and, of course, that's what everybody's talking about right now. But, um... How are you personally with the the COVID restrictions um, doing with like how your where you work is handling things and are you handling things the same way at your shop uh, Stanley's and the things that are implemented and things you can't do? How's that been going? They're about the same now. Um, I think everyone's kind of feeling the same struggle that works in a shop, like shop owners. It's um, you're paying more for PPE. So your your expenses are more now, but you're making less because you're doing like less work, less haircuts than you could have been doing before. But uh, I think the measures are important. You know what I mean? Like safety is like the first priority. And I'm just grateful to be open, really, because I was didn't cut hair for two months, so it's nice to be back. But um, at first, uh, I got a lot of capes, like a lot of shops did, and that became um, kind of like a logistical nightmare because you were using them once at a time and you have like you know 20 to 30 capes a day so you'd wash them and then like you if this is the saying if you wash them at your house and then you start to like affect your machines oh yeah and then you know so 
and then using more water, using more detergent, or what we also found that's been good um, that I see a couple of our shops doing, gotten like painter trap and just like cutting like cape size plastic, which is like good because it's like one per person and it's like easy to set up, clean up, throw it away, sanitize, like sanitary, you know. And um, we've been using gloves, not that it's like required by the state of New Hampshire, but it just seems like the right thing to do, especially right now, early on, like, let's do this right. Obviously, we're wearing masks. We have clean capes, whether they're brand new, being washed single use, or the plastic painter's wrap. And um, it's it's awesome that New Hampshire provided, like, um, shops with masks, too. So we all have plenty of masks to um, obviously wear and give out if clients don't have them. Um, I actually heard something really interesting on your show that people were canceling appointments because they refused to wear masks. That's gnarly. Yeah, I had, I, I had one or two customers yeah. that did that. I mean, I, I everyone has their opinion about what's going on, and that's fine, but it's like, these are state-mandated rules. Like, they shouldn't give anyone a hard time. It's like, you know, it's like it has to be done if you want the haircut. And Ooh. we have, I have an experience of that. People ask, they come in, like, oh, do I have to actually do this? And it's like, yes, you do. And it, it, it drops there, you know. So everyone that I've dealt with, I've seen in the shops that I work at and own, have been really respectful and cool about that. Well, and I don't fault anybody for not wanting to get a haircut with a mask on. Like, that's mm-hmm. your choice. And there, there is the, the consequence of if you're not willing to wear a mask to get your haircut, then you're not going to get your haircut. That's a consequence that you're willing to make that choice and suffer. I mean, it all depends on how much you hate hair. Yeah. <laughs> Whether or not it's like, oh, a harsh consequence. But, you know, we as humans, it's... That's what we do. We, we have the ability to choose things, whether it's mandated by government, whether it's, you know, we're under full oppression or not. It's the yeah. you still have the ability to choose whether to do something or to not. Technically, nobody can make you do anything. You, there's always an alternative. Yeah. Now, that alternative's consequence may be harsh and possibly final, but you still have that choice as a human. So I'm not going to fault anybody for going, all right, well, I don't want to wear a mask. Okay, that's fine. Then... You're not going to get a haircut. That's yeah, cool. It's like, as simple as that. And especially because it's not our choice. Like, we are required to require that. And I, yeah. that just is what it is. It's the, hey, I have to answer to a higher power like everybody else. And that higher power is telling me that I have to require you to wear a mask. Yeah. And, and I'm willing to provide that for you. But if, if you don't want to do that, that's still your right. Unless cool. you're getting a beard trim. Which then the mask can come off. Yeah, yeah, now we're getting into the the new restrictions that have been slightly lifted that don't always fall in the realm of logic. Yeah. But this is New Hampshire. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's the rule. Like, cause, um, I wanted to make sure we were doing it right, you know, because it, it kind of went like wildfire one day, like, we can do this. But it, nothing really changed. Like, I think the Stay Home 2.0 cosmetology had been updated, and it says, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but it was something like, the mask must stay on except for when it can come off. And it's like, what? So I called the board, and they said, yeah, that's correct. They can, you can do beard trims and shaves. The mask has to be on before if they're doing the haircut and only can come off during the service and has to go right back on after. And I said, okay. And then I also asked about, because this has been a big issue too, which I'm sure you've heard about, is the uh, children getting haircuts without, with or without a parent. Is that okay or not? And I was told last that they're working on it, that it's still like, one client per barber per shop you know what I mean? so it's like yes. it's, you had to re- i've had to refuse some haircuts because like obviously this two-year-old is not going to be okay alone you know well and and my thing with that is using common sense because yeah. heaven forbid that we have to regulate common sense um and what we have been doing whether the board has an issue with it or not they can contact me directly it's fine but what we do as common sense individuals is go, if your child is old enough to wear a mask by themselves, then we will allow the child to be accompanied by one parent. That parent stays six feet away from us Mm -hmm. and the service occurs. Everybody's still wearing a mask. And in my case, I have my own room, so it's guaranteed we're away from anybody else. But it's the, if your child is too small to wear a mask, then they'll have to wait until that that restriction is lifted yeah but there's there's no reason why a parent cannot accompany their child like they have a legal right especially when (laughs) you can cut the parent's hair and the 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 child can be outside and vice versa so you're assuming the same risk if obviously this parent or guardian lives with the child so it's like one of those things it doesn't make any sense 
especially if you're distancing, it's just like the three of you, the hair cutter and the two people. Right. But it's the, we're the yeah. ones who are taking the risk by having that extra person and there. They're, yeah. They're the, but they're the same risk though, if they live together, you Correct. know what I'm saying? So it's yeah, like, they're exposed to each other and you can cut both of them separately, but what is the point if they're the same like family? If they live in the same environment. Yeah. So it's the, you, yeah. it's, it's no different. Yeah, it's so that one's been more of an issue because I feel like it makes you the bad guy, but everyone's just trying to. It's like a weird time. Everyone's trying to do the right thing. We're happy to be back at work, and um, yeah, I don't know if we're just kind of seeing how this all plays out. Like, um, my prediction is, and I don't know anything, obviously. I'm just the dude who owns a shop and cuts we hair. We love shop. amateur predictions. Bring it on. I I don't know. It feels like everyone I talk to, it's like the masks are probably gonna stick around for a while. So I think now that you're seeing restaurants and bars open at half capacity. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit more capacity, but I think masks are going to stick around. Maybe we'll, we'll go to 12 people, and it won't be so assigned now. But that's just a guess. I don't really know what's going to happen, but what, what, what is the next step then? That mm-hmm. sounds logical. You also have to remember, because you spend time in those counties that touch Massachusetts. So for any of the counties in the state of New Hampshire that don't touch, so there's four of them that touch that have that 50% rule, Okay. but everybody else is 100% capacity as long as um. the tables are six feet apart. Mm-hmm. So it's all about like where you are because those four counties have ninety percent of the COVID cases, so that's why they have different rules because of their exposure and the the number of people that are commuting to and from Massachusetts, okay. where numbers are way higher. And even then, like Massachusetts has rules that are more relaxed than ours in in some ways. Yeah. And let's let's be honest, nobody, nobody who is coming up here for vacation is quarantining for two weeks before no. or after they get here. Like, nobody's doing it. No. I remember early on, too, that you see, like, signs of the highway, like, if you're entering Mass, quarantine for two weeks, and and there's so many people that work in different states and vice versa, but... Yeah, and that's the thing. It's, it's not practical in order to keep our economy alive for that to happen. But the screening questions that we are required to ask, which mm-hmm. we do in one way or another is an honor system. Mm-hmm. People can lie. There's no way you could prove it. Not to mention, I'm pretty sure like 60% of people that have it, COVID, are asymptomatic. Correct. So you're not going to have a fever. And like you said, people aren't going to necessarily be honest with you. Well, and personally, I have an issue with the uh, whole taking temperature thing. Yeah. So in my experience, the concept of HIPAA all right, so the temperature, compelling a medical measurement, your medical information, compelling that as a requirement to enter a business or to work at a business, and then discriminating against that data, that medical information, as to whether or not you can enter or whether or not you can work there. What, if you open that door with temperature, where does it stop? Because, all right, well, what other medical information am I allowed to compel out of you? And then and then determine whether or not you're allowed to be here. Yeah. I don't know. I went to a dentist, and they did, like, the thermometer, just like we've been doing with our employees every day. And they did, like, a oxygen test, and they do a... Well, I get, I get a medical stuff. facility. Yeah. Like, medical facility has professionals who okay. are trained and certified to take medical measurements. That's different, I guess, yeah. I go, yeah. that is where medical records occur. I get that. And you have that doctor-patient confidentiality situation. Like, that's that's a safe area for that to happen. But outside of a medical care facility, barbers are not doctors. We have been told without fail that we can't diagnose anyone with anything. Well, we were surgeons at one point, you know, <laughs> so maybe. Yeah, but they've ousted us since then for the last yeah. couple hundred years. Yeah, it's been a couple hundred years. But, um, so, uh, yeah, you make a good valid point. Yeah, and even though we are trained to I- learn to identify yeah. certain things, we cannot diagnose them. It's the, I appear, it appears that you may have this, but I can only refer you to your doctor to get that checked out. Like, I can't tell you whether you do or don't have that. Yeah, I agree that it definitely seems invasive. But, like, just having that information out there, like, it's one thing to have a device that'll show a green light or red light as to whether or not you're in that range. Yeah. Because then it's not an exact measurement, and it's the either you are or you aren't. It's a yes or a no. Mm-hmm. But not a, a determination based on 
a measurement when we're not certified, we're not qualified to do that, in my opinion. Like, that's that's not our job. So I think that that opens some things up to some lawsuits. Because I'm always thinking two, three years down the road yeah. when people are trying to, like, change legislation and using this situation as a precedent. That's that's not cool in my in my book. So much sanitizer, antibacterial soap. So much. And well, uh, wasn't it like eight years ago they were like superbugs? We're making superbugs. I hope I don't get these like dates messed up. I'm gonna try to. I I say this every day to every customer, so I should get this right. So basically, we were told when we had to close that we were gonna find out. We we're no no sooner than May fourth we we're gonna open or we we're gonna open May fourth, and then we find out like May first. Um, we don't know what's going on yet, but we know you're definitely not opening May 4th. And then, like, May 3rd, they're like, okay, you can open the 11th, but you have to have all the stuff that you can barely find. And the reason why we're saying the 11th is to give you a week to get it. Yeah, which was pretty stressful, you know, but I feel like a lot of the stuff that, you know, four months ago, you could have walked to Walmart and you could have got, you know, toilet paper and paper towels, antibacterial soap, Clorox sanitizer wipes. Remember those? <laughs> <laughs> like it was like an easy thing now it's like you're a lot, i feel like a lot of shops you can see struggling in new hampshire they're like we don't even know if we're going to open yet till like june because we have to get all this stuff and we don't want to open and have to close you know what i mean so it was kind of scary to like wrangle all that stuff up but we definitely made it happen at all the shops on that and it was a lot of like spending a whole day going to like five stores finding like one of these things and it was crazy buying stuff online hoping they're going to come in on time well, I know a lot of shops that had to wait another week before opening. They didn't open until the 18th yeah, uh, instead of the 11th because their their PPE didn't come in yet. And with the reliability of shipping being very up in the air, yeah, uh, you never know when they're going to arrive. I got these disposable capes, <laughs> and they came, like, so late. And they were, like, a, f- a sixth of what they should have been. These, like, plastic things. They looked like a half a plastic bag. And I remember trying to put one on the first customer – and I was like, I look like I have no idea what I'm doing. I tied two of them together. It looks so crazy. So now I use, I have a ton of this plastic, you know, and I like pick up after my dog after with it. I mean, there's nothing else I can do with this plastic. Well, see, and that's the other thing that I find interesting about the whole pandemic situation is that so many things that we cared so much about suddenly just are thrown out the window. Yeah. Like the whole wastefulness of all this PPE going, especially with disposable capes going, yeah. this is plastic. The dreaded evil plastic yeah, that we've been trying to not <sighs> throw into Mother Earth. Please don't get me wrong, too. I am like, I like to think of myself as a pretty like Earth crew. I'm just trying to make a small carbon like footprint of the Earth. And uh, it does hurt to do all this stuff because like, I, it, it like weighs on me using all this plastic and stuff, but. It's almost like a necessary evil. It's like, do I break my washing dryer or <laughs> or do I use these for like the summer? Or we don't really even know what the deadline is, like when we could do what and Well, on on the subject of the plastic, yeah. you got to remember that in the state of New Hampshire, this is all we know about. We're not <laughs> professionals for any other state and their regulations, but they specify on the concept of permeable or non-permeable being whether it needs laundered or to be disinfected. Mm-hmm. So if you're using plastic capes, you can, in essence, you still have to use one per customer per day, but you can knock it down to the what, 20 or 30 capes that you use a day yeah. and disinfect them with your disinfectant sprays like, and just have them hang dry, and you can use them the next day. That way you don't have to throw them away that because they're non permeable So that might be a solution for you as yeah. an alternative. I don't know how much space you got to be able to hang 20 or 30 plastic capes around to, to dry, but True. maybe you could do shifts. I don't yeah. know. It, it was cool, too. There's, like, some companies that really, like, I think came out for, to help out barbers and barbershops, like um, like Bonafide was one of them. It looks like they sold all their capes for, like, wholesale. They were all, like, eight. I think they're still, like, eight to 12 bucks. That's, like, half or less than, like, what a lot of people are selling oh. for. Just to be get them out to people, you know? And, like, it's good for them, too, because obviously brands them out, gets their brand out, and it helps – so many shops that need, you know, clean, fresh PPE well, to and, work. And for them, like, even selling them at wholesale, like, they're still making a little bit on that. Yeah. Which helps them survive because when barbershops are hurting, they're hurting because we're not ordering oh, stuff from totally them. Totally not, yeah. If we're, yeah. If we're not buying product, then they're not selling product. Right. And I think with uh, 
with capes meant capes ended up being worse than toilet paper for our in- industry. Like oh, totally. getting them, if you you know went through a barber catalog, it was the if you end up paying like twenty four, twenty five dollars a cape, which is insane. Yeah. Uh, and then you have no idea when they're gonna show up. I think it says a lot about a company too, the way they act during this. And they will hopefully be remembered in a good light. Like, hey, they did this really solid thing, and they helped a lot of people. And it's like a win-win for everyone, really. Even if they lost some money by selling a product for less. I feel like I'm doing a bona fide commercial. But it really, it was helpful. And I know it helped a lot of other shops out, too. So, well, and I was, thank you. I was <laughs> super grateful being able to order from uh, Prospectors and Uppercut Deluxe, yeah. uh, the ones that I carry, that they had capes available. So I was like, can I get two or three dozen, please? Yeah. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah, it's the minimum, yeah. Well, and they were, for reopening for some states, they were offering really great discounts, uh, awesome. like big orders. And I, I was fortunate enough to have the capital to be able to take advantage of those large orders. Yeah. Number one, I'm like, I want you guys to still be around. Yeah. I don't want you, like, you know, having to fire your reps or anything like that. And number two, you've got stuff that I need. Yeah, totally. And yeah. some of the capes, uh, I mean, we had never used before, and... I kind of like them better than the capes I had. Yeah. Like, so. just, you know, instead of having snaps pop off, it's uh, having a, a hook with elastic. It's kind of nice. Little things. Favorite, details. Favorite cape. Scrunchy neck, little hook. You gotta hook both sides. Yes. For years, I didn't know you were supposed to hook both sides. <laughs> it would stick in, and it'd be a hole. I'm like, what is going on with this? And then someone showed me one day, and I was like, oh. And while we're talking about, like, hooking things, I just want to tell this. I mean, Barbara's kind of here right now, probably already figured this out or seen this on Instagram. But in case you haven't, there's a really good trick that I didn't invent, but I saw this on Instagram. You can like take a clip or a comb and take someone's mask if they're required to wear it in your state and kind of like put it underneath their ear so it stays over their mouth and nose and you click in the back and this leaves you the, uh, you know, room to arc around their ears and get all the hair and the sideburn and taper it out. So it's, that's been like the big question. Oh, how are you going to get around my ears? How are you going to do my sideburns? How are you going to, you're going to blend my beard, right? And like, yes, we're going to do this. Oh, yeah. Everybody's concerned about that. I'm like, we've been doing this for two months. Yeah. Don't worry. We figured it out. True. <laughs> but I, I have had people hit me up, too, because like, our state opened up above, uh, above before, rather, other states. And I'm like, how are you doing this? And I was like, oh, we're doing like this. And I'd like, find a picture. And like, here you go. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's helpful for sure. You know what I mean? Well, and even as simple as like if somebody comes in with an elastic or tie um, mask around their head, I'm like, all right, so we're going to switch that out. I'm going to give you a disposable with ear loops. This is going to make everybody's uh, life easier. That's a really good idea. I probably shouldn't even tell the story, but I've definitely cut some masks off. <laughs> um, usually two of the, <laughs> the state provided ones. It, it's just going to happen. So like you just said, definitely be careful <laughs> or have them use like the state provided ones. Uh, I've only cut like one good mask, but it was all good. Well, and believe it or not, like there's the, the state does only – gave out an initial order Mm -hmm. for us to get started and now we're responsible for our own but if you had like a solid first order and it's like you're still on it awesome really yeah i haven't been in touch with them yet but i remember they're saying order reorder more i remember thinking like i should probably reorder more but i didn't want to be part of the whole hoarding problem of like i'm gonna get more even though i don't need them now because i'm gonna need them and i find that we don't go through too many of them too much of them and they're like a lot of clients i would say 80 to 90 percent of the time probably closer to 90, bring their own mask. Yeah. And they're already prepared, which is cool. And um, we did some cool ones at Stanley's too. We had like some cloth ones made with the logo. And there you go again, like branding, you know what I mean? And so. Right. It's easy. And it's easy. And we just give them out too. So it's like, cool, wear this. And then like you go to like the convenience store next to it and like, oh yeah, cool. You guys sold up there. Oh, you're doing appointments now? Neat. Yeah, you know, it's just like. Same at the supermarket because that's where everybody has to yeah, wear yeah. a mask. It starts the conversation. Definitely. And with the, with the state stuff, it's. That I don't think that they realized how many businesses needed how many masks. Yeah. Especially our industry. But, like, oh, totally. they were like, all right, well, um, we gave you guys an initial order. Like, we can't afford to give you any more. But now you can get boxes at Walgreens. Like, they're yeah. all on the shelf. There's plenty of PPE everywhere I, now. Distri- I knew distributors, too, had them, too. But it's like, they're kind of expensive. Like, 50 cents a mask. Like, that adds up when you, you do, like, you know, hundreds of haircuts a month. And say you're just planning out thinking no one's going to come in with it. So you get to have like, you know, thousands or like hundreds of masks, you know, just in case. Because before we knew how it was actually going to like roll out, you know. Oh, you're planning for the worst. The whole yeah. Time. You're like, I need this, I need that. I definitely ordered a lot of stuff. I spent tons of money and have tons of gloves and sanitizer and antibacterial soap 
it's wild. Oh yeah, I got capes for days. The yeah, yeah. gloves, gloves. Uh, like we were never required to wear gloves, which you stated before. For me, the reason why at first I wore gloves was because every winter it just gets so dry here mm-hmm. that my hands crack from all of the hand washing that we do all the time. The stuff we're always required to do, always in barbering. Uh, so my hands just always crack. Yeah. And because I knew that, I just wanted to prevent it. And I'm like, I can just wear gloves and spare my skin. Yeah. Um, but that uh, didn't last forever and because it's not as dry as it is in winter. So we got the humidity going, so my hands are better off. Um, plus, found a great supplier for hand sanitizer, uh, Winnipesaukee Whisker Oil. Mm. He makes phenomenal hand sanitizer that's really moisturizing. That's also awesome. a good gel one. Yeah, well, it's it's liquid, um, but we got a big old pump at the the front of the the barber shop, and we got little ones at each station. But it's the ingredients are really really good because he's not a distillery the way that a lot of people who are making hand sanitizer are. So under, I think it's ATF regulations for distilleries, they can't add certain things Mm -hmm. to what they distill, flavors and all that. So because he's not a distillery, he's using isopropyl alcohol already. Yeah. um, And he works with oils and that sort of thing all the time. He made a very moisturizing formula, which is great. So we love that. That's excellent. A little um, plug, not a sponsor. (laughs) I have the opposite. uh, I'm not going to mention the name because I don't even want to give them any credit at all, but I got burned super hard with the company with sanitizer because I was like panic buying supplies we needed to open. And I got like three gallons of sanitizer in these little bottles. And it was like three, literally three gallons. And these like probably 50 of these little bottles. And it came to like $400. And I was Ooh. like, I was, and this is like not good gel foam sanitizer. This is like, like DIY liquid. But I was like, I need this. And then like the, the sales rep, cause I like bought it. And like sent them an email, and the the rep hits me up, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you put an order in. Are you interested in buying still?" He didn't even know that I put an order in. I was like, "Yeah, um, I already put an order in." He's like, "Oh, cool." And I was like, "Oh, so since you're calling me, can you like give me some of the money back if you want to do the wholesale?" And he's like, "I'll get back to you." And then he called me back, and he's like, "No, I can't do that. But next time." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm never gonna call this company again." <laughs> never. But they they gave me a product, you know, and it's just one of those things. Like sometimes. People take advantage of the situation. You know, I mean, we needed these products. It was like, you need sanitizer. You need, you know, you more capes. It's like, it's not a question. So people sometimes, you know, I noticed that when everyone was buying gloves, they kind of like seem to double in price all of a sudden. It's like, oh, this box that's usually 10 or 13 bucks is like $25 now. So it was kind of crazy to see. And I think during that same time, it, we were very fortunate because if you have a network of barbers in the area, I think we did a really good job that we reached out to each other and really like shared uh, links for for supplies, mm-hmm. you know, links for where to order the masks from the state from, and like if somebody had barbicide because that was a hot commodity for yeah. a little bit, um, you know, reaching out to your fellow barbers that you know might might need help, especially if they're like a one chair shop situation, mm-hmm. where it's like, hey, you know, I found a really good link, check it out That's if you awesome. need it. Yeah. I did a lot of that too, like reaching out to locals around because it's like you want everyone to like be all right and do good, you know. Well, and and then we were very much living the mindset of we're all in this together. Like totally, we're all in like a hole and we need to get out. Yeah, let's all you know make a tower of people. Hurry yeah. up! Yeah, um, a lot of networking. Like, what are you doing? What is, like, how does this work? Is like yes, because we all wanted to make sure that we made it out, and we all want to be doing the right thing too. You know what I mean? We all have like high standards in the barbershop, you know, and you don't want to just be like winging it and just open it up and just barge it, no mass, no whatever, just like yeah. crazy stuff, you know? That's how you get in trouble and yeah. make headlines. But I mean, I feel like now the, the tone and the perspective of people is altered. Like, I feel like psychologically there's about a 90 day period of the human experience where we will tolerate almost anything Mm -hmm. for about three months. But once we pass that point, I think that's why jobs have that, that preliminary like probationary period of 90 days before you're like eligible for benefits and like totally a full-time employee uh, because it really tells you like that's the 90 days to find out who you really are. 
and how you really react to things yeah. and you stop being nice. And I think that's what we're seeing now that we've passed that three month timeline. That's like, all right, we're done playing now. I think we're people getting are, tired. are getting restless too. And like, they've been kind of like cooped up and they, it was easier to coop people up when it was like kind of like a colder spring, but now it's summer. Everyone wants to go to the beach. Oh yeah. Everyone wants to go out and do whatever, you know? And, well, uh, especially because we have such hard winters here. It's like yeah. we only have like this much of summer. Well, like I said earlier, it. it snowed eight months this like past winter. So it was like, and not even like a lot of snow, just like enough to suck. You know, like, like oh, it snowed, it went away. Four months. Yeah. Four months of good weather. Not into it. But uh, yeah, people are restless. They want to, they want to go out there and live their lives. You know, go to Hampton Beach and. And I, I can't really blame them. Get a uh, t-shirt. Maybe with spray paint or something. <laughs> Get some do. fried dough. Go to Blinks. Oh, yeah. Totally. That's what I thought was hilarious, too. The whole, like, trying to <laughs> control the beach. It's like, okay, you can go to the beach, but you can be in this crowded sidewalk and everyone's getting Blake's fried dough and spray paint t-shirts, but don't lay down on the beach. Even though you're going to – you're just, you know, I don't know. You can't do anything. Either it's open or it's not, and – can't control people sometimes. Well, and, and that's the thing. I think with um, some places that are trying to gauge the decision on whether or not to make masks mandatory, you would really have to think on um, the enforceability of it. Yeah. You're going, you really have to, because like, you have to look at the entire situation from beginning to end. It's, um, all right, so you're going to require masks at all times, like in public places. All right, well, how are you going to enforce it? Like, who's going to enforce it? Because mm, right now... The whole concept of police enforcing isn't exactly the most popular. Uh, so there's that. And you go, all right, well, what will, what's the consequence for them not following that order? Because you have, to, you have to create one, right? Otherwise, there's no incentive to follow the order. Yeah. All right, so well, how do you decide what the consequence is? Is it going to be a fine? Is it going to be something else? Like jail time? Like what? Because you have to go, all right, well... Is that a reasonable consequence? And is it effective enough? Like, is it severe enough to warrant the the following of the rule? Yeah. You go, and you have to compare it to rules that already exist, laws that already exist. It's like, it, it's kind of like the whole drug law thing. Like, how are you getting life in prison because you got, you know, three drug charges in your life and you got more time than somebody that killed someone? Yeah. You go, you have to measure these things because they matter. And the enforceability of something like that is next to impossible. I haven't thought too much about the enforceability of it, but I think that the mask in a public place is a respect thing for like, hey, I might have this. I don't know if I do. If I haven't been tested and I'm asymptomatic and I don't want to get you sick if I'm like a younger person. So I look at it as a respectful thing. You know what I mean? So I think it's a good idea. You know what I mean? And even if it's wrong and it's like a hoax or whatever, then what's the worst thing that happened from you wearing it? You know what I mean? Oh, you had to wear an uncomfortable mask. I mean, my ears have been burning from like little rope and the string for the last six to seven weeks. Well, especially because you wear glasses. And oh, I'm sure totally. It's <laughs> been terrible. But like, it's like, I don't know. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Not to like, I don't know. It's an inconvenience. Know? It's like, an inconvenience for it. sure. Yeah. But I don't think it's like worth revolting about. Well, and I, I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a serious enough thing to compel someone to do. Yeah. It's the, all right, you're a human. You're an adult. The majority of people out in public alone. It's that you have that choice to do it. And yes, I, I strongly believe that it is a respect thing because it's not about you. It's about other people you're around. Yeah. And you don't know what you have. Um, so, but I, I don't think that respect should be uh, compelled. Yeah, I, I feel that is a human choice, and and of course this is my personal opinion. I'm not endorsing it for anybody or you know any sort of situation like that, but you still have that ability to choose, and and, I agree and people with that. see that and because I see people, respond. I don't, I don't, I don't judge people when I see them doing whatever they're mask, no mask. I might feel kind of like taboo if I have it on and they don't, but I'm not like offended. I'm not like running around them. If I have to walk by someone, I'm just gonna like live my normal life. I'm like, all right, I have this mask on. I'm getting gas. I'm going to douse my hands in sanitizer and get back in my car. Just because now I'm, I'm always over critically thinking of what I'm touching, what I'm doing. But I I, don't know, I guess I see both sides of it. You know what I mean? 
Oh, but I think you you know definitely. How do you police that? Should you even police that? You know what I mean? I think I kind of agree with you. It shouldn't be a thing like that. I don't see someone go. Someone needs to call the cops. And like you hear like people like do that kind of stuff, and it's like calling people having parties and stuff. It's like mind your own business. Or or calling businesses just to see. Yeah. Like, is it your job? To regulate this? Have you guys no, had that happen? Like people calling? No, we uh, haven't. But I've heard stories. I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, every time I get a phone call and someone asks how much the haircut is, even though it's probably a customer, I always think it's another shop. Like, <laughs> they want to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't have enough time in my day to bother putting any energy to <sighs> thinking that anymore. <laughs> well, we're pretty transparent with all of our like, costs and everything. And they have gone up a little bit, I think, where a lot of people have. And, and it's been cool. There hasn't really been any – I've seen any backlash. People have been respectable and understanding – that like, hey, you guys, to run the business, to be open, you're doing, you know, fewer haircuts and you're paying more to be open. In the, I don't know, people have just seemed to be awesome. Oh, yeah. In, to in our experience, too, for sure, people are, are very understanding. They, because you don't see the, the line and seeing how busy people's shops are, yeah. uh, they always make a very good point of po- making a point to ask, going, how are you guys doing? Like, yeah. are you doing all right? Are you busy? Because it's not apparent. I hear that every day. They're stoked to get haircuts, too. Oh, yeah. I was worried, not worried, but I was thinking that people would come in, like, sketched out. Or some people. And I'm sure some are. And um, But everyone seems to be not. Like, they're just, like, happy to be there. And they understand we're taking their precautions. And we got well, the little, like, COVID things hanging up. Like the, uh, not COVID things, like the <laughs> the Barbara side uh, little thing, you know. Yeah, the, the, the wipes and you yeah. know, the visuals that make people feel safe and go, oh, you're using disinfectants. And though it's like, we always True. You have these disinfectants. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> even like the whole barber side, like uh, COVID-19 and certification, it's all like kind of common sense you've already done, you brushed up on, something for us to do when we were bored on Instagram while we were waiting to go back to work. But it does look nice, and I think it does reassure some people. And it, there's been a lot of other barbers making fun of people having them and stuff. I got them. I got them taped to the mirror. Only for the cool. gram, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I never printed one out at all. No. But... I will say I learned one thing from that test, that there's only a two-minute contact time for the wipes, and I was ecstatic to learn that. I went, yeah. sweet, <laughs> I have to wait less time now. Oh, yeah. But, man, Johnny, it's been great talking to you. I appreciate you coming up, making the trek up to, to come have a chat with me. No problem. I'm um, honored to be here. Thank you for hitting me up. So moving forward, you are... Um, you know, plugging along with the shop at Stanley's and, you know, building the brand and doing great things. And we look forward to, to seeing what what's next. Uh, definitely go and follow him on Instagram and on social media platforms all over. And we'll keep an eye out for you. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. No problem. Thank you.